everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second day of Stop the Hate Week events. Uh, this is our last panel for the day, but not for the week, uh, but it is a very important one. Middle Eastern North African performers, Hollywood's journey to equity. I am uh, very pleased to be here uh, to have our very fantastic uh, ACTRA and SAG-AFTRA national board member, New York Vice President and the national co-chair of the Ethnic Employment Opportunities Committee, Ezra Knight. Ezra is a veteran of stage and screen with a long list of credits, so I could be here all day. Billions, blacklist, law and order, law and order, law and order. But uh, <laughs> it's the work he does on behalf of sag After members uh, that so many of us love him for, in addition to his great career. Uh, it, the work of the EEOC has really been impressive uh, for sag After, and its conversations have been central to what we're doing this week. Uh, so Ezra is not just uh, all of this, but he is a terrific partner and a great champion for members. Uh, some of you also probably have seen him on Broadway and things like uh, Pretty Women, I know I did, and a long list of uh, other fantastic TV shows. But for today, I'm going to put you into the good hands of uh, New York Vice President, Sir Knight. Take it away, Ezra. Thank you, Lady Dam Damon, our wonderful New York President and sensational national VP. Uh, it's an honor to work with you and it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the EEOC whose work is all about uh, focusing on the racial and ethnic groups that comprise SAG-AFTRA and the American scene that we reflect and we continue to do so in the work, the casting and uh, the enforcement of our contracts all throughout the working industry to support uh, what our members do. Um, and the stakeholders in this effort. Uh, we educate our members as well, as well as outside of the industry, our, our work spans the globe. So that work is very, very significant. And I'm happy to be a part of that to speak to non-discrimination and the issues of fair employment. And for the MENA community within SAC-AFTRA, Middle Eastern, North African, the challenge is obvious to anyone who is watching and performers find themselves taking on roles in productions and television and film that we know are often challenging and speak to volumes and this panel is going to address that. To moderate this panel today, I get to pass the baton to Azita Ganizada. Uh, Azita also, not unlike myself, <laughs> has an incredible list of credits uh, in film and television from General Hospital to HBO's Entourage her own experiences in the industry also led her to become a passionate activist, just like myself and so many of us. But she is for MENA as well as for South Asian performers. And uh, that resulted in many things uh, as a path-breaking accomplishment and a partnership uh, uh, with one of our four panel members today, uh, Seth Cohen. Uh, Seth Cohen, in 2017, the two of them uh, helped to create for the first time in 37 years, uh, MENA, was added as a new diversity category in the 2017 SAG-AFTRA AMPTP TV theatrical contract. And that is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Applause, finger clicks, all that. That's an incredible accomplishment to put MENA on the map as a significant uh, representational group in, uh, in the work that we do in this industry. So bravo, Azita and Asaf. And, uh, and thank you for your courage and your work and devotion in bringing that work forward and championing for sag after. So I will pass the baton on to you, Azita. Thank you so much, Ezra. Like, it's such a pleasure to be here. And I know that this is going to be an incredible conversation and, and we don't have much time to cover everything we want to. So I wanna kind of begin by introducing our panelists first. Um, I wanna start with Maha Shalawi, who began her career as an actress Post 9-11 though, she found her passion being an advocate and producer for the Arab American performance community. She is now the program director for the Think Tank for Inclusion and Equity, a group of working TV writers advocating for diversity, equity, and responsible storytelling and entertainment. She's also a creative producer and consultant through her company, Past the Mic Media. I am so pleased to welcome my friend, Maha Shalawi. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Next up is Omid Abtahi. 
Omid is a seasoned actor who booked his first on-screen role in 2004 playing an Afghan interpreter on JAG, which was the starting point for many MENA actors at the time. Um, you can see his work on, like I said, numerous television shows, including American Gods on Stars and The Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. Omid Abtahi, hello, welcome, and thank you for joining this panel. Yes, thanks for having me. It's an honor. I appreciate it. <laughs> Next is the stunning Yasmin Al Masri, who is an international actress and human rights advocate. She has starred in a series of critically acclaimed award winning films, such as Nadine Labaki's Caramel and Julian Schnabel's Miral. Her breakout role was in ABC's hit show Quantico, where she played FBI twins Nima and Raina Amin. She strives to bring global awareness to projects that represent the Arab world and women in ways that break cliches. She's also the founder of Uncensored Narratives, a creative lab and platform. And I'm so happy to get to know her and meet her here today and introduce Yasmin El Masri. We have another panelist joining us who is running a few minutes behind, um, but I'm going to go ahead <laughs> and intro him for when he does come on. Uh, Ezra mentioned him a little bit, Asaf Cohen, who has been an advocate uh, for the MENA inclusion for years and was instrumental in bringing recognition of the MENA category into sag after TV and theatrical contracts. He has starred in many films, network pilots, and has been a guest star and recurring actor in nearly 50 TV shows. He's also a former sag after National Board member. Asaf Cohen, where are you? We're all waiting for you. Thank you for joining us when you finally get here today. <laughs> um, now quickly before we dive into the conversation, which is I'm very excited about, since we are still relatively new since September, 2017, I wanna make some open uh, opening remarks on what is MENA and what is MANASA, which are the two casting categories we've helped build into the business. While the MENA region consists of countries including Algeria, Bahrain, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Israel, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, Oman, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Tunisia, United Arab Emirates, and Yemen, we also include Armenia, Turkey, and Afghanistan. And when it's Manasa, we include the South Asian countries of Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and Sri Lanka. I think it's really important to remember that, like the United States, this is a very diverse region and many diverse countries that include many minority ethnic, religious and linguistics groups. The MENA region itself also includes many Afro-Arab countries. But for the purpose of casting and diversity, equity, inclusion, we recognize Afro-Arabs have status in casting and DNI under black hiring practices and standards. And many South Asian countries under Asian hiring practices and standards. However, we all share many connections across history and culture and most certainly here as performers. So with honoring the complexities of our MENA identity, I want to jump right in and talk about how we as a group have not had a seat at any table in regards to diversity and inclusion until myself, Asaf Cohen, and a few other performers, including Amir Talai and Amin al Gamal, who helped us lobby and successfully build the MENA category into SAG-AFTRA, which has ended up having major ripple effect across all entertainment, including most recently being included in the Academy's hiring standards and practices. So without further ado, I want to, oh, there's Asaf. <laughs> so without further ado, I, I wanna kind of talk about that even still with all of this success, being now included in research and being included in um, the Academy Standards uh, Hiring and Practices, now being included in the Writers Guild, why are we still not in every conversation? Maha, maybe this is something you and, you and even Asaf wanna jump into. What kind of an impact have you noticed from uh, MENA being included actually into SAG-AFTRA, but across all the companies and all the disciplinaries in the industry? Um, first of all, thank you for creating the category. <laughs> Just, I think that really needs to be said. I have been in this space of trying to advance sort of MENA storytellers and performers for a long time. And honestly, it never dawned on me that there was even a lack of category. In part, that's because I have a stronger theater background, but doing the work of naming things is so incredibly important. And it's this very contradictory thing where this categorization and naming is also kind of an act of white supremacy, right? And yet at the same time, we have to figure out how to get named in order to be seen, in order to participate in the industries we want to participate in. Um, 
how that's changed numerically, that's not an area that I can speak to, but maybe SF can. Uh, but I can say the ability to name and measure is crucial. Uh, I do think there is um, an unhealthy attachment to incremental change, which may be why the, the change you hope to see is not happening rapidly enough. I am not a fan of incremental change. I, have, I was recently wrist slapped into being happy with a very small change. Um, so while this is a moment where I think people are more willing to hear difficult things named, I think there's a lot of training that needs to be undone about how long it takes for things to happen. So part of that may be why you're not seeing the change. The other thing is what can happen is when things become measurable, they can also become disheartening because now you are actually able to put a number to what you have long suspected and so then you will start to see a rise in representation and then it will become a conversation about the quality of representation. And then it will be about trying to open people's eyes even wider to the systemic nature of this issue so that it's not just a lack of representation on screen. It's not just a lack of representation in the writer's rooms, which is where I'm currently working. It's not just a lack of representation among executive producers and beyond that. There is a question of the internalization of all of this within our own artists and creators. So all of these things contribute to why we're not seeing the change as rapidly as we want to. You would think you could just say, look at this. This is a freaking mess and that it and people would galvanize to change. And unfortunately, if that were the case, this would be a very different country than the one we're in right now. Um, yeah. Those are my not so sunny thoughts, but they're my thoughts. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it's really valuable in the space of you feeling like you don't like incremental change. I mean, in, in our experience, it, you know, this was, I think I called SF in 2015 and said, wait, help me. I just was told I was white at a table read. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, and uh, at a t network pilot t table read, and Asaf was like, "Oh, okay, you know, here's some people to connect to," and I kind of connected to people, and then more and more Mina performers started to hear that, and then more and more people kind of were like, "Wait, Azita heard that," and then, and then it just kind of like became this ripple effect of all of us beginning to communicate and collaborate, and Asaf was like, "Hold on a second, like, and you know, then this kind of team was built, but that was six years ago, you know, and and now we're here, which to me, I can't even believe it was four years ago. And, and I don't know that I've quite seen the change over that I would like to see, but to continuously now be in the conversation at all is so valuable because it gives us the space to build off of what we are building. And like, even though it doesn't happen overnight, I look towards our black brothers and sisters in the arts and our Asian brothers and sisters in the arts and look at the change and the incremental change that they've had to do and how they've had to uplift each other. And so I feel, I feel some um, sense of hope in that space. Asaf, what, what do you feel about what kind of an impact you've seen since, since we've gotten status, casting status? Yeah, um, first of all, I'm gonna say it's, it's an honor to be here with this with this great panel, and I apologize for being late, uh, and I missed the beginning, and I apologize for that. Uh, but it's it's truly wonderful to be here, and I'm so glad and so grateful that we're having this opportunity to talk about this matter that is uh, that affects so many of our members. Um, yeah, as as you as as I'm sure that you, as Azita mentioned, as other people on on this uh, were tuning in, I'm sure have experienced. You know, you you may have been surprised if you are of. Middle Eastern North African descent to to have found out that you are not not that you were not considered diverse or ethnic and I remember this was always something that came up uh, for me and I, I was kind of shocked because I'd never really thought about that so much you know like as Maha said you know if you come from a theater background there's there much more there 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 had been a lot more flexibility in that realm. Um, but when I the role would come out and you know my my representative would say oh they're looking to go ethnic with this and I go well hi, that's, I'm brown. Um, and they go, yeah, they're thinking one of the more established recognized categories. And I go, categories, what is there? Do you have to fit into one of those boxes, you know? Uh, and, uh, and I, and uh, there was no category for, for Middle Eastern North African performers. Um, whereas other, uh, other members who do fall into those categories did have that. And so, 
And for casting purposes and for our employers, you know, they wanted to be able to say, to, to say, look, we are being inclusive. They're trying to do the right thing a lot of times. They are, they are trying to do the right thing, but we needed to help them find a, a way to, to create a category and to, to, get, to have enough buy-in so that they could, they could have that. Um, but I, I, I know that many actors in our category uh, were denied opportunities uh, because they were not considered diverse. They would even show up, uh, one actor who I, I will not name, uh, um, who is a friend, it was a Middle Eastern, um, uh, North African descent, and he uh, showed up to a test, a studio test for a, a major, major show. And they wanted to know what percentage Latino he was. And he said, I'm, I'm not Latino, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm from this country, I'm a Middle Eastern country. And they said, oh, and they said, you know what, that's, we can't move you forward, unfortunately, because that's not diverse. And he's like, this is insane. This is insane. If I hadn't told you that, if he would have lied, had to put, uh, been untruthful, he may have moved forward. And we should, and it's horrible that someone feels that they should have to consider doing something like that. And so we, we, need, we need to applaud what our brothers and sisters have done in other categories who have seen movement, who have fought tooth and nail to get it, you know, with the Oscars so white movement, you know, it, that put the fire under under people's butts to say, this is not okay. You can't just have pure Caucasian and say, this is America. That is just not, everyone knows that's not true. And that's just, it's wrong for every kind of reason. So we applaud that. And we say, that is fantastic. And we see the same from our, from our Latino brothers, Latinx brothers and sisters. And for the Asian community right now, which is coming, you know, under under attack, which is horrible, of course, beyond horrible and to say you know what we should we should, we should learn let's let's lose all we need to advocate for for our members who fall in this category as well and so when we were able to get enough critical momentum in no short part thanks to azita the bulldozer the workhorse thank you for all of your hard work and efforts on this you specifically um we were able to to do that and to get that achievement and and uh, now we do have something that that employers can 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 check off and say, okay, good. So I am being inclusive. They they always knew it, but my litmus test was like, look, if you can't if you can't cast me as a white supremacist, then you can't say that I'm white. You know, that's that's just to think about it that way. Uh, and that I guess that that resonated uh, among other things and all the data that that you would supply Zita and in your research and and all the people who who helped with that. Um, but we're moving the ball down the field, and we need to. Uh, be united and not fall into traps, I guess is, is, is something. I, I'm, I'm off the original question. And, uh, <clears throat> no, it's something. wonderful. I, I just want to piggyback on what Asaf said because I didn't include it in the opening remarks, which I wanted to, but there was a, a lot of um, specificity I wanted to say that we need to do explain that the reason why the MENA category was created was because performers from all of those countries that I named in the beginning of the opening remarks we were all placed into the Caucasian box when diversity became of the utmost value. This was around 2014, 2015 when people were really being measured. And so our community, because we, we, we didn't have a box, fell into the Caucasian box. However, we are not, we're too diverse to be white and we're, you know, uh, not white enough to be <laughs> diverse or whatever, you know, so we were being erased and also had this impossible journey to hire us. And I think the, the quick question just back to you, Asaf, is have you feel like you've seen a change? Has it helped? I think it's helped our membership in general a little bit, yes, uh, to, because I know that people wouldn't be seen for certain roles in general because they said, oh, this is gonna be ethnic, diverse, and you're not, you're white. Uh, and I, and you know, a lot of times casting directors were, were trying to be allies. They're trying to say, of course, this person is is not, you know, uh, is not is, is somebody who is uh, diverse, uh, you know, from represents an underrepresented uh, community. Um, but they would get pushback from the studios and networks who are saying, look, we want to make sure that we're doing right. And so uh, now that they have this category that is it is contractually uh, recognized, you see it in breakdowns. It says, you know, it'll say the whole list, the laundry list of, of uh, underrepresented communities, and there's uh, Mina or Manasa in there. So that does make a difference, and I'm I'm really happy for all the future members who will never even 
even understand that there was a time when MENA was not considered a diversity category. So good for them and good for all of us. Yeah, Azita, we, can I come in? Yes, I wanted to ask you next. Um, yes, mean, but please add uh, in this space. But I wanted to ask about how you felt marginalized or excluded. But if you have something you want to say about this, please. I, I, I just love. Uh, I want to take it back to your uh, to, to to the opening of this, and I would like to bring a different perspective on what Mina is. Of course, your work and Asaf's work were very important to fight, to have the right to have access to audition for projects in town. But we're not white and we're not black. So the fight that our brother, uh, our, our black brothers and sisters are doing is very important. And it's very important to, to differentiate ourselves from that because even us in our countries, like I speak for the Arab world, we discriminate against our black community. And I have a friend who is, whose name is Priscilla, who just created um, uh, um, a collective called the Black Iranian Collective because she's half Congolese and half Iranian and she's speaking for black people in Iran. And this is another category. Uh, being black is about skin color. We haven't been discriminated against because of our skin color. We have been discriminated against in Hollywood because of what we represent in terms of content. Our personal experiences, our cultures, our religions, our perspective on what's happening around the world, our voice in telling our stories. That's, what, that's how we have been discriminated against in Hollywood. Whenever there is a story that's being told about this part of the world, there is always a white writer in the room with a white showrunner, with a white producer deciding that they know how to tell the story better. So when you when you come and audition as an actor, you have very little left. You just have your face to put on the narrative that's been chosen for you. And, and that's how we have to fight as actors who come from this part of the world. It, 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 I wanted to share something like when I was doing my homework before, before we start this, the word Mina, because I nobody ever explained to me where this came from. Where did this, vocabulary came from MENA, M-E-N-A. What does it stand for? Who came up with it? And I go on Google, Google the word MENA. What do you get? MENA is an English language acronym referring to the Middle East and North Africa. It's alternatively, it's alternatively called the WANA, W-A-N-A, -A, West Asia and North Africa. The MENA acronym is often used in academia, military planning, disaster relief, media planning as a broadcast region and business writing. It doesn't even exist in the United Nations. They don't use it. So you're already using a, a, a term that's been fabricated by, again, by a white privileged institution. So. So, okay, I, I want to fit into it because I want to work, right? We all want to work. We want to be happy and be positive and, and be against hate and against racism. But we cannot give ourselves to all these vocabularies without coming in because we're, cre we're creatives, we're artists, right? It's our job to educate the town about who we are and what we represent. So we cannot accept to be called MENA without explaining in Hollywood, what this stands for. Because you look like me, Azita, you could be my sister in a movie, but I have no idea what it means. I, I don't know the history of Afghanistan. I don't know about Pakistan, India. There's so much difference between Lebanon already and Egypt and Morocco and Tunis and Jazair and Libya and Mauritania and Indonesia. Uh, people consider us the same because we have that skin color or they consider us the same because they think Islam is a majority religion in our countries. What is it that connect us? What is it that make us be in the same basket? Uh, it's a long conversation. I'm going to stop here and let it, you take it's, it over. It's, it's a, I mean, it, th those are all wonderful and beautiful points. And I think that that's something that's always that comes up. And, and that's why part of the opening remarks is that it, there's complexity and there's there are a many minority ethnic and religious and linguistic groups throughout this region that we want to honor and that we do want to honor, uh, you know, everybody of every skin color in that space, specifically the reason why we had to go with the, the category is so that we had our own lane because we didn't fit into any of the 
hiring boxes. And in the United States and in businesses and in corporations, we have to fit into one of the hiring boxes. It happens across every university. It happens across all of those things. And so the data was actually pulled from WHO, the World Health Organization. It was pulled from the World Bank. It was pulled from Investopedia. It was pulled from um, academics who were writing the MENA category for the US Census. It was all based on what we were trying to build into the US Census for 2020, which was in a pilot program. So everything that I pulled, I talked directly to the academics that were doing the category four. So that's how we found out what MENA was. So it's a relatively new term, which is why I tried to go through it and explain it because before, yes, mean before we had MENA, we are counted as white. So we cannot even get accurate counting in the United States of what our population is, right? So they don't know how many of us are. And when we aren't counted, we don't get funding, right? We don't get funding, we don't get status, we don't get access to university programs, we don't get congressional dollars, we don't get like uh, money for roads and bridges even for our communities. And so it's so important to try, even though, again, it's a, under a construct of, you know, this Western society and what they've been building and implicating, even the MENA term, because we include some of the countries that were part of the greater Middle East. It's because we are all connected through the same kind of story, which is we all kind of play in that same zone in this film world, which we need to dismantle and disrupt. But the only way we can dismantle and disrupt this is by becoming creators and creating our own content and storytelling and taking control in that space, but also by working within the system to disrupt it, which is what we're doing by trying to break through and get the data and the research so that we can then give it to disruptors and filmmakers and people and say, no, 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 we're 0.3% in the Writers Guild. This is not good enough. There needs to be more writers. We need more writers writing stories about the Middle East. It cannot be, you know, a white showrunner and no Middle Eastern writers in that room that actually have power, not low level writers, but power in that room. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do from within the system. So everything you say is absolutely on point. And I agree with you, which is how we try to address the complexities, but it's too nuanced of a conversation for just this one conversation, which is why we all have our organizations that we're trying to do. We each have our little piece in the puzzle, right? Like Maha has what she's doing. You have what you're doing with your creativity. We have what we're doing at MENA Advocacy. Um, so, Omid, uh, let me just throw, throw to you. I just want to talk a little bit about your experiences. You've been acting uh, since 2004, that pivotal role of, of an Afghan interpreter and in JAG. <laughs> I'm sure it's on your reel still. Um, talk, <laughs> talk to me a little bit about your experience as a workhorse of an actor. I mean, you, I mean, so many people have seen you and so many things. Have you felt like there's been a shift and adjustment in the, the landscape since there's been this category or have you felt like you continue to be marginalized and sent out on same roles? Like what's your experience been? Um, well, I just want to uh, preface that. I mean, I've been on American God since 2015. So I think when Mina came up and I've been contractually obligated to American Gods until recently when our show got canceled. So I can't speak too much on the, the whole casting process. But what I have noticed, and, and, and Maha mentioned it, was incremental changes. And recently on two different, you know, you know of all things, voiceover projects that I'm, I'm now a part of, uh, one of them, when I self-taped, it was for, you know, in voiceover, you, you have a little bit more freedom to, to, to expand, you know, who you can play and what you can play, as long as you can do a successful, like, accent or voice or whatever. Um, and so I, there's this one project I... I for I didn't forgive me I did an Indian accent and I wanted to book the project so that I can then have the conversation with the producers about changing the character if we can to you know Iranian and if not that at least some kind of Middle Eastern character but I noticed that this time uh, they asked for you know in a, in a, like a meeting with me and they were the ones who brought it up they said we want to be sensitive to the fact that you are not Indian you are Iranian and we want to change this character to, to, to represent you truthfully. And I was kind of taken aback by it. This isn't voiceover. You know, maybe I would expect this from on camera, but I didn't expect it from voiceover. And, and another voiceover project that I was a product, part of, they, they, they reached out to me. They're like, we want to create this character closer to you. Like, are you, like, what is your religious background? What, is, what can we do to, to respectfully portray this character? So there's, 
there's been an upping of sensitivity to who we are and how different and uh, how new, you know, how this, you know, we're not just either all Muslim or not, you know, it's like, it, we're not <laughs> within the Brown, we're so different. And so I, I feel like there is, you know, they're being more sensitive to it from a, at least a, a you know, a producer standpoint. So, but casting, I, I can't quite speak of as of now. That's, I mean, I think that's wonderful. And it, it, it kind of pushes us into the next conversation, which I think is gonna um, uh, have, everyone's gonna have something to say, which is on authentic casting. Um, it's a real hot topic. Like Yasmin even just said, her and I could play sisters in a film, but she doesn't know anything about Afghanistan, you know, and I know very little about Lebanon. I mean, I know some things about the culture. I have friends and all of these things, but in the space of authentic casting, which is a, a hot topic, there's been recent buzz um, with the United States about having a South Asian cast to play an Afghan. And even Oscar Isaac, who is Guatemalan, has played Middle Eastern a couple times most recently. Um, it, I think, I believe in Moon Knight, he's potentially playing Middle Eastern. Um, as actors, how do we feel about this? Do we feel like Oscar is such a chameleon and he should be able to play Italian and uh, Spanish and British and Middle Eastern? Uh, do, do we feel like that's, you know, working for us? How do we answer fans and social media users and cultural ambassadors that, you know, want more specificity? This is for everybody in the conversation. Who, so who would you like to go first? Yes, mean why don't you start since you jumped on? Okay, so so Oscar Isaac is playing an Egyptian god, and um, Moon Knight is is one of the uh, few characters in in the Marvel world that uh, tells the, the story of an Egyptian of Egyptians. So um, I was asked a question uh, a year ago. I played a Syrian refugee, and I'm half Palestinian, half Egyptian born and grew up in Lebanon. And I was asked, how did I bring myself to become the character, although I am not Syrian? And I explained how I worked on the dialect with Syrian people. And because my past, my experience as a refugee allowed me to know what this woman went through, brought the authenticity to my character. I don't think as artists, we should ever stop advocating for a human being right, wherever they come from around the world, their right to connect emotionally and authentically with another human being's experience. I, as Palestinian, wanna be able one day to play uh, a Jewish woman, why not? Because this will allow our people to have common understanding of each other maybe. So uh, I, we should never tell someone, you don't have the right to feel my pain. You don't have the right to portray uh, my experience, because that's against art itself. Art should always be free. But how are you able to bring the authenticity? That is something else. And, and today we're not discussing that. Today we're discussing when Oscar Isaac gets the privilege to be offered to play Moon Knight, because he is, he has all the nominations in the world. He has all the awards in the world. He has the greatest agent in town. This is where, privilege is become a discrimination against every other Egyptian actor in this town who will never have the opportunity to audition to play the Egyptian god that their ancestors are all about. This is where discrimination happened. When I see that Gal Gadot is gonna play Cleopatra and I don't get to audition for Cleopatra, I am furious. But I know that she is a box office star. Everybody want to invest money in her. People know if they put the money in her, they'll get it back. If people put the money in Yasmin al-Masri, who's going to go watch the movie? So the way we can change things, because this, this conference is about how we can change things, is about how can a star like Oscar Isaac help another Egyptian actor share the platform with him? how the writers in the room can create a character that is as important as Oscar's uh, character on the show that will bring and represent the authentic Egyptian man in the story. It's not about feeling guilty because those big stars exist and they have the platform. It's about how they are sharing the privilege and how they are sharing their platform with the people who, who have the right to tell the story themselves. I think this is a very important thing going forward. 
and I and I don't want to take more of the time in this space. I want to hear everybody else. I, I think it's a I think wonderful points, especially touching on privilege, because I do feel like, you know, in our community it becomes more heart hot button. But when it's you know an Australian, you know, or you know a British person playing a American hero, we tend to be less you know up in arms in that space. But when it's within our community, we're all kind of up in arms. But what you said is actually quite brilliant about how is it that you know the, the the production or you know if the if audiences are going to come and see oscar then how does the production then honor the actual culture by making sure that oscar we ra we raise up we rise up other egyptian stars in that process so that potentially that egyptian star can then go on to be the next moon night and that's truly how it happens and that's a beautiful point is how somebody takes their privilege and then gives them the opportunity because there aren't that many egyptian actors that have the storied career and the access that oscar has had and so it is it is upon them to kind of our gatekeepers to help us push through that. And that's that's a wonderful point. I'd love to hear from Maha who probably has a different perspective than the actors, but I'd love to hear from you. Um, I have both. I uh, I think what was just said was so beautiful. And because I'm like the boo on incremental person, I'm gonna just also say a little further. There's a reason that the Oscars have the privilege, that the Gal Gadots have the privilege, that more people know Meryl Streep than bloody Viola Davis. So there is a part of me that's like, absolutely yes. If you are privileged enough to get those roles or be in those movies, I am a big fan of when you get to walk through a door, bust open the door frame and bring as many people as you can with you. I think that is absolutely right. Um, and I, I, I guess I wanna widen the conversation beyond those glossy, shiny roles, which, Yes, they will go to box office draws. It's also the mid-level and the lower roles. How do you become a box office draw? When your characters, I mean, this is why I'm so grateful you raised awareness of Mina, because I think there was a lot of shifty casting going on in the past. I'll speak from my own experience. I used to get sent in for Native American a lot. So we'll, we'll use a parallel conversation to make the point. I stopped going in. The more that people stopped going in, the more people were forced to find and elevate native theater artists, native actors, indigenous writers. So I do think there is something to be said for constantly, constantly pushing back for accuracy. Absolutely, yes, on the art point, I some of the favorite sort of artistic explorations I have done have been, I mean, guys, I'm half Filipino, half Syrian. What role? What am I like? What are we doing? There's a reason I stopped acting, frankly. Um, there's there's a whole other conversation about also constantly being cast in trauma that my parents emigrated to escape, and now I'm making a living performing the very trauma that my. Um, but back to this. <laughs> back to this. I I think it comes not just to the star roles. It comes to insisting on at least a base level of authenticity, where you kind of lose me and the conversation is like, oh, they're Lebanese, but they picked a Syrian. I'm like, yeah, no, I feel that. I do. I'm, I'm not gonna put my energy there, but I'm like big upping you from the back. Like, yeah, reach for the moon, we'll get a star, have that conversation. But the box office draw thing irks me because we cannot become box office draws. We cannot become a Gal Gadot, we cannot become Oscar, I love you if you're out there, I'm a big fan, but we cannot become those people if we're not um, pushing for at least a certain level of authenticity all the way up from, from the voiceover all the way through to the Egyptian god. It's beautiful and I wanna go to Asaf and Omid because I, I wanna hear what they feel about authentic casting and, and, its, and its space, but I do just wanna piggyback off of what you said, Maha, is a really great example of how we become that is, um, Sam Ismail is an Egyptian American writer and he created Mr. Robot. And Sam was determined to cast a, an Arab in that role. He wanted someone. Now I would have preferred that he named him Amin totally. instead of, instead of uh, Elliot, but he found Rami Malek through his now wife, I believe, um, through a small film that, that Rami had done. Rami Malek had done, and then Rami won a Golden Globe for Mr. Robot. So it took a it took a 
MENA creator to hire a MENA actor who then gets the platform to win a Golden Globe, who then gets the platform to play Freddie Mercury, who then becomes that Freddie Mercury did biopic numbers. It was the number one grossing film of its year. It did Disney Marvel numbers. And then you get Rami now becoming a Bond person. So there is a trajectory, but it does take creators of, and it takes gatekeepers saying, no, I need this person to be of this background so that I can uplift them. Um, Asaf, I mean, please, I want to know what you guys feel about like, you know, all the, the pushback on social media with like authentic casting and like, how do you feel the responsibility is for you guys as actors, just trying to get a job, like <laughs> trying to pay our bills. Like, how do you guys feel about that? Um. <clears throat> Like, honestly, when I, when I hear the term authentic casting, it, it kind of puts the fear in me a little bit, right? Because, if, because to what extent are you trying to be authentic? So it's, it's yes, you got to establish a baseline. Because if you take my resume and you, you filter out to just the roles that I was authentically casted in, I, I, you could probably count on one hand how many rights, I mean, how many parts I was authentically casted in. And then, you know, and then you can go a step further. Okay, I'm Iranian. So if I can't play Arabs, can I play Iranians? No, my Farsi is not that good. The second I open my mouth, you can tell I was, I was a kid who was, who grew up in America. So it's like, so yes. Yeah, so when I initially hear a phrase like that, I get scared because it just makes, it's putting me further and further into a box. I'm already in, in a box based on my skin color. Now, like, I feel like, but, but I think and I don't know what the solution, but for me, it's, and this has been like this for me with every role I, I've taken, it's if I can bring more positive to that role, then there are negatives. If like, then that's my baseline. Like I remember one time going in for this film, auditioning for this film called Kingdom. I had four pages of Arabic, like just taken in, I took my sides in and you know, when you first start as an actor, you are willing to twist your body in every shape and form to become whatever and whoever to get that, those first initial parts. And so this was earlier on in my career. And literally in that, in that audition, I lost where I was in my pages and I started speaking gibberish. It was so humiliating. I'll never forget it. And it was from that moment, I was like, I can't, I can't. That role deserves better than what I can bring to it. And I've been a little bit, you know, definitely more, uh, selective in what I can. So, so yeah, I just, but like take a role like American gods. A lot of my favorite roles are the roles that I have. I'm very, I'm nothing like I, I got to play a gay Muslim Arab. And I don't, I don't identify with any of those things. And that's what makes that role. One of my favorite roles. So, so yeah, I do feel a sense of fear of like, if I'm not allowed to play those kind of roles, then, you know, it's just going to make it harder and harder. To, to make a living as a, as a working actor, honestly, yeah. Asaf. So. Uh, what Omid just said there was, it was just beautifully stated and I find myself in, in, uh, in agreement with, 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 very, with a lot of what he's saying. You know, when I hear authentic casting, I, I feel torn because just like Omid said, there's the part of me that fears that, well, if they're gonna be so authentic, I myself, you know, I'm a first generation American, you know, Jewish of, of Arab descent, you know, family coming from, from Yemen, um, but I'm not this character, I'm not this. So they're not gonna want me or they're gonna, they're, regardless how good my performance is, there's gonna be someone who says, well, he's got a Jewish last name or so he can't play, so he can't play Arab or he's got, um, he looks Arab, what we think an Arab looks like, which is a whole separate matter, of course, because it's a huge region and people can be very, very dark to very, very pale and everything in the middle uh, and say, well, how could he play Jewish because he's got brown skin, that the Jews are all Caucasian, Ashkenazi, right? Wrong, but regardless, it, it creates that set of uh, anxiety within me. And that is countered by my, my desire to see more representation uh, of people who are not getting opportunities, just like 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 Maha said, like Yasmin said. So I I feel that you know, and as actors, you know, we we are portraying, we want to portray characters many many times that are like Omid said, nothing like us. And when I think about my characters that have been most uh, some of my most favorite characters, 
In fact, I would say almost always my favorite characters are nothing like me, if not, uh, never mind national background, but at least uh, character-wise, essence-wise. And I, I, get, I get worried that the more we try to be precise and accurate uh, for, for the most noble reasons, the more there's a potential backside where we are going to potentially miss out on some wonderful opportunities when an actress or an actor is in the ballpark. For me, look, if oh, there's no reason why why Yasmin or or couldn't play uh, a Jewish woman, absolutely, why not? You could play Lebanese or Syrian or or even East Indian. As far as I'm concerned, if you're in the ballpark and you have the skills and the talent, if you need to speak fluently in a certain language, and that's a skill set, if you have the feel and you capture the performance and you are believable and you are in the ballpark, then to me, I'm comfortable with that. You know, I don't want to see, I remember talking to a friend of mine who's Puerto Rican who got really, really close to a major, major role because, but then was, was cut off at a certain point. And the reason they told him was that, oh, they want to go Dominican and you're Puerto Rican. So that's not accurate. And, you know, and you see that you see equivalents in all the different categories, you know, well, you're Nigerian. How could you possibly play Kenyan or you're, you know, you're Vietnamese and they're looking to go, uh, you know, you're North Korean and they're looking to go South Korean or, or vice versa. At some point, everybody has a different comfort level of how accurate you want to be. But if, for me, as long as you're in the ballpark, I'm okay with that. I, I think every, what everybody's saying is wonderful. And I love hearing everyone's perspective. I think the solution to this is that we are communities that are starved for representation in general, and we're starved for parts. Exactly. So if there's only 0.3% of us on screen and we're only going for one part, and it's just the one part written for a Mina character, then we all feel like, okay, well, we're, you know, we got to get to it and we need authentic representation. And what actually has to happen is, and why we created the category is so that we are seen for every role. We are seen for the, the that there is that blind casting when you're playing the best friend, you're playing the CEO, you're playing the football star, you're playing whatever, that we are just in everyday roles, that we don't have to just play in the MENA space. We can play just all these other parts so that it isn't contingent upon our ethnicity. Our diverse background is secondary to what it is that we are doing. And that's how we create equity for ourselves. And that's how writers and other people create equity for, our, for us in the business is that, hey, Azita is going to play, you know, Samira in this part, but it has nothing to do with her ethnic background. In fact, we don't even go into that until episode five because she's this girl that's looking for love. And this is how we end up getting ourselves out of this like fight for authentic casting and this fight for like, well, we need to, we need that job or this has to be perfect because we are communities that have been starved for representation. And so our audience members and our communities and our fans and the people that are watching just want to see themselves reflected because they're like, well, what about me? And so, yeah, yes, me. Yes. Please. Azita, the only reason why we're having this conversation now is because there isn't enough work for people like us in <laughs> yes. Hollywood. Let's be honest. Yes. We should, we should, this is, this is humiliating that we're even having this conversation. Now let's be, let's talk business. Hollywood did not care about our parts of the world because we are not a market. There is something called the Latino market, American Latino market. There is something called the Asian market. When, and when, when we say Asian market, I mean China, a lot of money is invested in this sector. There is something called um, uh, India. It's a huge market for, for, for Hollywood. Now, how do we become relevant for Hollywood to get more work? That we want to talk about the solution, right? We need more content. So we don't have to fight. There is, en there is so much stories to tell. Although we are not important in numbers for Hollywood, we are very important and relevant for Hollywood in terms of content. Because most of the complexities in the political American life today come from our parts of the world. The war in, on Iraq, 9-11 connection to what terrorism and Islam means, um, uh, Palestine, uh, um, uh, Israel, um, uh, Lebanon. But, uh, America's relation with our part of the world has been mainly political and it's been mainly built on conflicts. How do we flip that? How do you flip that game, that negative narrative into something positive? And how can we create a space for our stories so that we all have 
jobs so that an Iranian actor doesn't have to freak out about playing an Arab character because he doesn't speak Arabic. It, it, it's, it's unfair to put each other in this position. It's disrespectful. There's so much art, so much stories that each one of us have to offer to America to change this negative connotation to what the word Middle East is, to what Islam yes. is. So the solution going forward is content, content, content. We need to invest in content. And, and that's beautiful. I love every point you made. And I wanna say that something that we talk about that we try to educate people and say is that it's not that we're underrepresented in Hollywood. We are overrepresented on screen, right? They're always playing in the Middle East, except it's always a white savior narrative. There are no heroes or nuanced Mina characters in stories that use our geographical backdrops. And that's something that's a major problem. And then people, when people are writing those stories, it's a perfect opportunity to add a, a layer in a nuanced character who is Arab, Egyptian, uh, Afghan, uh, Palestinian, whatever it is in that space. And that's kind of how we start to create a little bit of equity because they are playing, They are. it's 100% right. They are playing overplaying in our space. We only have 10 minutes left. So I wanted to, because this is Stop Hate Week, which kind of what Yasmin said kind of leads us into this. I wanna talk about the fact that, you know, per one of the, um, research research um, research that we did 78 percent of the time Mina performers are on screen they are portrayed as violent okay so that was our 2018 report that we put out so 78 percent of the time that people from our part of the world are seen on screen we are portrayed as violent now these dangerous tropes have had major social and political implications I wanna ask our panelists, what do you think the role of Hollywood is in the uptick of violence against our communities? And what are some of some solutions for the writers and executives who are gonna watch this? I'll jump in. Yes, Mina, I love everything you say. Let me just put that out there. Also everybody, this has just been so wonderful, but I, I um, content, absolutely. Uh, Hollywood is, I believe that if a James Bond movie can inspire people to buy Walkmans and watches and cars, we cannot pretend that Hollywood does not impact the way people interact with the world. And when you give a statistic like that, I feel rage, um, even though that is not a surprise to me. Um, I think the amount of mental space, the Middle East, Muslims, Arabs, Iranians take up we take up so much real estate in the American imagination, and it is such a flawed real estate. It's so problematic. It's shaped by the news. It's shaped by Hollywood. And I want to just throw out something that a friend of mine, I'm going to name him because I want to try and name other people. My friend Zahir Ali, who is a fellow at a place called the Pillars Fund, and he's an oral historian, shared with me his hope. Uh, for Muslim storytellers in Hollywood, and I think it fits here as well, that stories become, we, we were fighting about this word authentic for many of the reasons you said, not fighting, but like we were fighting with the word itself. And he said that he had been using the word intimate and that he wished to see more intimate stories from our communities. And that to me is everything because Azita, what you say about how we are so often abroad, like at home and we're often in the background, we're often the long shot. We're often the crowd of yelling, angry Arabs in the background. We're often the crying women wish, you know, give me a fricking close up. Be intimate, let me say an intimate story. Let me tell you an intimate story about growing up in Jersey. Let me tell you an intimate story that doesn't rely on me being one of the five geopolitical tropes you have in your head now manifested into some sort of, you know, CIA fantasy. Exactly. Stop putting guns in our hands. <laughs> yeah, let me tell some intimate stories. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, I want to, because we've got six minutes sure. left, so I want to go to everybody quickly, you guys, maybe two minutes each. Omid, you want to jump? No, no, it's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I definitely think we, uh, you know, Hollywood and, and, and the stories we tell in Hollywood, you know, definitely have an impact. I think when, whatever the year was, when there was that Muslim ban that came out, it kind of really took me back. And, uh, and it's whether, you know, it's 
but you know, it's, I think middle America sees these NCISs and, and shows like that where, you know, a lot of us, a lot of time we're portraying terrorists and that I want to say like, not all terrorists I've played, I consider bad. Like some of my favorite roles like Sleeper Cell, when there's a story to be told or a movie like Paradise Now, when there's a, when there's a story of why people believe what they believe and, and have, you know, act the way they act, those are interesting to me. But I think because we have two minutes, the answer to something like this is to sprinkle more MENA actors throughout society. I think, like you said, Azita, and where it's not, we're not playing these characters that, you know, are telling these stories informed by 9-11. We're just part of society. And you have to go on IMDb to look up this actor who's playing so-and-so role, lawyer, cop, whatever. Oh, this guy is Iranian. I had no idea from watching the show. I just know he's brown. Um, so I think, and I think we have to desensitize people because I'm sure at one point in time, a black man with a white woman on screen would have stopped society in its tracks. And so over time, we have, people have become accustomed to that as they should. You know, we are, we all are, even though we look different, we all have the same feelings, love, fear, hate, anxiety. And we are all in, in our core the same. So the more we desensitize people, the more people see us in normal everyday roles, I think that will happen incrementally. Sorry, Maha, but over time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Oh, let's go to Yasmin and then we'll end with Asa. Uh, I go back to what I just said. The relation that the US have with most of our countries has been mainly political and built on conflicts and built the only source of information about our cultures has been the news for the American public. We have to take our story away from the political and from the cliches that Hollywood has been relying on and bring our stories. And when I mean our stories, I mean humanize ourselves because we have been dehumanized and we have been put in a category that's like you said, related to guns. I wanna finish this by, say, by reading something from Aladdin. Oh, I come from a land, from a faraway place where the caravan camels roam, where it's flat and immense and the heat is intense. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. <laughs> we have to end that shit. That's Aladdin. That's, that's, that's a huge movie that Hollywood stood by and put millions of dollars behind. We, we have to hold these people accountable. They can no longer get away with this bullshit on screen because kids are watching, adults are watching. We have, we have to learn from our black brothers and sisters. What the Black Lives Matter movement is doing is a lesson to everybody, everybody, not only Asian people, not only Arab people, not only what they are doing, they're actually winning wars for us. We, they are on the front line. They are re-educating Hollywood. They are losing lives to change the game in Hollywood. We just have to look at them and really learn from what they're doing because they are doing it. That's it. Thank you so much for having me. Azita, can I shout out some things that I didn't think of in the beginning that are as a direct result of your work? Uh, because <laughs> let's, you let's, it yes, out. So let's, the Middle Eastern Writers Committee now exists at the WGA in yeah. a small part to your report. Thank you. You're welcome. And we have Amina fact sheet coming out from Thai that is in part inspired by your work. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I want Asaf to jump in and talk about how he feels Hollywood, um, what some solutions are for writers and executives on, on uh, helping this 78% of the time violent trope. It's true. You know, what Yasmin was said just resonated with me so deeply uh, that we ha we have to we have to change the the narrative about what it means to be Middle Eastern. We see everything through the you know the the American lens, which she said is a political one, but that's not all of us know. You know, people like we said, people are people. People are good. Mostly, most ninety nine percent of people are good. They want what's best for for their families, and they want to have a, a a future that they can have something positive to to look forward to for themselves and for their children if they're lucky. Um, so we need more content, like it, like we said, but we also need to recognize that now that they have this this category, 
we need to put a little more heat on them because before what, what I was told beforehand is said, look, you guys don't have my, my, one of my representatives told me, said, look, you guys, you're, you're, he called us the brownies you know, affectionately. He said, you, you brownies, you're, you and your brownie friends are being discriminated against and you don't even know it. Well, we, we knew it, but we didn't know how collective it was. And he said, they are relegating you for the most part to stereotypical roles because the Caucasian roles, the mainstream roles at the time, they were going to mostly Caucasian. And when they wanted to go to diverse, they'd look for the, the boxes that they already, and now that we have that, there's no excuse anymore. And say, look, there's half a billion people on this planet, hundreds of thousands of Americans who can now be represented in three-dimensional fleshed out characters and not just storylines that have to do with national security, you know, and not just, not just, uh, the taxi driver, the 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 doctor, the you know all all those roles that we've been many of us have have played, and that that's a, that's a step. So more content, putting more fo voices forward, and truly, here's the crazy part: supporting one another. Yes. Because the Middle Eastern yes. the Middle East is not known for everybody getting along swimmingly, but it's not that case in all the other geographical regions. You look at the Asian the Asian world; they don't all get along. You look in the Latin in the South American Latin world, they don't all get along. In Africa, they don't all get along. Why should we be held to a different standard? So I think what you said before is open the gate. If you're lucky to get through, try to bring in more, more people with you. I, I love that because it's collectivism. Collectivism is what wins at the end of the day. It's the heart of that's what unionism is all about. You know, we all work together. I think that's so beautiful to kind of end with. And I just want to really quickly say that everything everybody said was so brilliant. I mean, everyone's point is is right on is right on point. Um, I do think it's important just to say thank you to the other communities that are involved in these conversations that are uplifting this work, uh, the black communities, the Latinx communities, the Asian community, our trans community, our um, performers with disabilities, our um, indigenous and native performers as well, who are collectively inspiring the work that, that we've been doing at MENA Arts Advocacy Coalition to plow this lane. It would not be without you guys. And we are here alongside of you and to the gatekeepers and those that hold privilege privilege in this business. It is important that you listen to these stories and you hear that the things that you ha write have major social and political implications for real human beings, many of them on this screen, and you do need to do better. No more stories about us without us. Please continue to listen to these conversations and learn and grow from them. So with that, thank you so much everyone for tuning in to this important MENA panel. I want to send it back to Rebecca Damon. Thank you so much sag after for hosting this beautiful week. Oh, it was our honor to host this week. And Azita, that's fantastic. Having you and Asaf uh, here together. Uh, uh, I remember the day that Asaf uh, proposed in the W&W and, w and we, Ezra and I were in New York that day. Uh, and it's such a beautiful journey because it's a step. Now, I loved also hearing that I feel like we're at a time of great acceleration. And so like, I think the, one of the things that I took away from this panel is this is our moment to all of us collectively to put our foot on the gas pedal. And that was one of the things that uh, no, no more, you know, let slowly, slowly, slowly does not work anymore. And it didn't work before, but now is an accelerator moment. And I think that this uh, conversation is a big part of that acceleration and the work that you guys are doing. So I just, Hats off to everybody on the panel. And uh, Ezra, thank you for that fantastic in, in introduction there. Uh, this was a really important conversation. And so I hope people will continue to push this out through their social networks uh, to make sure that people who missed it will have an opportunity to see it. For those of you, uh, for, for us in the East, it's already uh, after six o'clock, but uh, West Coast only three in the afternoon. You can go back and catch programming from earlier in the day. You can join us tomorrow. You can still have your friends register. We're gonna be back here at 915 Pacific, 1215 Eastern for more of the Stop the Hate Week programs. Let's use this moment of acceleration. And if you need to visit sag aftera slash stop the hate, you can register there for more information. Uh, be involved, be engaged. Thank you guys. What a great conversation. Yes. Great conversation.